In this video, I'm gonna show you the exact design principles that I use to turn a good website into a sales machine. The best part is you don't have to be a designer to pull these off. Let's dive in. Now, I'm gonna break down each of these tips into six different categories. And the first is simplicity, because you've gotta understand People don't read websites. No, they scan. And so you have to design for scanners. Take a look at something called a heat map. What this is showing is where users are paying the most attention to on a website. So the red sections indicate a lot of attention, and then it goes down from there with yellow, green, blue, and white. So you can pretty much see in this image that people are just kind of bouncing around. They're looking at the headline and then they're going over here to this gal's face and then they come down a little bit over here, maybe look at the button. So you've got to design with that information in mind. So how do you do that? Well, this website is a good example. They're using really bold text as their header and then short chunks of body copy because a lot of text is really intimidating for a user. And then use icons and even contrast with buttons in order to make sure that the most important information is being perceive. I like to say that you want to caveman proof your layout. There is a amazing book called Don't Make Me Think by the original OG of all things web design, Steve Krug. And he talked about how if someone has to figure out where to go or what to do next on your website, they're going to leave. And so keep the amount of thinking that they have to do down to a minimum in order to really improve the amount of sales that you make on your website. So, so how do you keep things simple? Well, there's a few things that you can do. First, you want to stick to familiar design patterns. And what do I mean by that? Well, in the design world, especially with websites, there are all of these UX patterns that people are kind of used to. So this website is a great example. Typically, when you hit a website, you'll see a logo in the top left, then you'll see the navigation, there's going to be some calls to action, and then headers, body paragraphs, and then also some different buttons. So you don't want to get really creative with the designs that you're making. You want to stick to familiar layouts because those build trust and make it easy for users to navigate. Another thing that you want to do is use something called visual hierarchy. And you've probably seen something like this where you've got really big, bold text that says you'll read this first and this kind of stands out the most with the contrast and the spacing and the size. And then you see another smaller line of text that is still pretty seeable, but at the same time, not nearly as big as that first thing that caught your attention. And then it says, then you'll read this. And then finally over here in the bottom right hand corner, it says, then maybe this, and this stands out the least. So use this on your own website. You want to make sure that the most important thing gets the most attention and then supporting details always come after that. And every layout should visually tell your user where you want them to look. And one thing to really help as you do this is to use a grid to keep the content organized. Most websites are laid out with a grid system. And typically on desktop, there's going to be 12 columns. And then on mobile, there'll be even less, anywhere from eight to four. And so use grids to lay out your content so that people can easily look through it. So align text all to one side, align images together, even spacing and consistent margins and even proper alignment can help reduce friction and really improve clarity. So make sure that you're implementing that on all of your layouts. Hey, by the way, this is part of our full series on how to skyrocket sales on your website. We've already talked about copy layout and messaging, and this is where design just kind of brings it all together. So if you're building a site that is meant to sell, make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss the rest of the series. Okay. So we talked about simplicity. Now let's talk about structure. You want to make sure that you give every section of your website just one job. 
Don't overcomplicate things by adding a lot of stuff that users are able to do because then they're gonna get confused as to what they should actually do. So keep messaging simple and keep the call to actions really clear. Don't say, hey, sign up for my newsletter and buy this product and schedule a call all within the same section. I even like to say that every single page needs to have just one thing that you're wanting users to do. And while you're at it, make sure that people don't have to search really hard for their next step. In other words, don't bury the lead. You wanna repeat your CTA throughout the page. Don't rely on just the hero or the navigation. You can see on this website, Rivian's done a fantastic job where you don't have to scroll too far before you start to see other calls to action, right? And you wanna do that. So place buttons after every single key message or even think through what would a user want to do next whenever they engage with this section? Would they want to click that button? Would they want to learn more? Those are the types of things that you need to think about as you're creating your website. But always make sure that buttons stand out no matter where they are. Don't let your buttons blend in, right? Use really bold colors. I like to use just one color for all of my calls to action. That way, when a user sees that color, they almost intrinsically know, oh, I'm supposed to click that. But you can also do things like adding white space around those buttons and making sure that the size is big enough that they stand out. If it's important which buttons really are, then you wanna make it obvious. That being said, if you've ever wondered if there's the perfect color to make a button, this next tip is for you. You wanna avoid clickbait design myths. And for a while there, there was this idea that red buttons were just way more clickable or enticed people much more to click on them than blue buttons. And studies have shown again and again, that's not true. So use whatever color you want to on your buttons. Just make sure that they are distinct and they stand out. And also use directional cues like icons that are pointing towards where you're wanting people to focus. These subtle cues can guide attention to where you want it to go. Also, you've got to realize that hardly anyone scrolls on websites unless you make them want to scroll. How do you do that? Well, I like to say that there are three C's of scroll ability, right? There's connection. So make sure that each of the canvases are connecting to the next section. And for that, I like to make sure that I avoid window height canvases. So those are canvases that are the entire height of the screen. So a user might see that window and say, oh my gosh, this is all there is to the website. And so they're not gonna be enticed to scroll down. So avoid doing that. Another thing is create some curiosity. So what I like to do is visually link each section to the next. So you might have an image that overlaps the bottom of one section and then goes to the top of the next so that when I see that image, if I want to see what the whole thing looks like, I got to do a little bit of scrolling. And then finally, add some cliffhangers. And these are great devices. You would especially know this if you've ever watched a TV series and the end of an episode just leaves you on the edge of your seat and you say, I've got to know what happens next. And so you just instantly go to that next <laughs> series or the next episode. So you can do that with your design and your layout as well. You can do it with your text, kind of leave people wanting some more to where they kind of keep scrolling, or you can do it visually as well. This is a great example from Monica.im where they've got an image that you see the top half of it, but if you're wondering what the rest looks like, you're going to be very intrigued and it's going to entice you to keep scrolling. Next, let's move on to our text. Now, you might be wondering, why are we talking about text in a design video? Well, here's the key. Typography is your most important design element. Yeah, it might just be words, but the font choices that you use can really determine how users engage. And that font choice is all about 
design. So make sure that you're choosing real clear and legible font families for your paragraphs. You can see in this script font, it's really tough to even make out what this is actually saying. So this would be a bad font to use if you're wanting people to read it. And also avoid font pairings that clash. So lots of different fonts make it hard on the users to actually read because if they see one font and they go to the next and it's a completely different font, their eyes are gonna have to adjust a bit and that's gonna make it hard for them to actually continue looking at what you're showing them. Now, there are some designers out there who would say, just use one font family for your entire website. I'm not one of those designers. I actually think that font pairing can be a really helpful component of good design on a website, but just be intentional about it. And with that, you wanna make sure that headers are easy to recognize. So what are headers? They're different pops of text that separate each section on a website. And you wanna keep them visually consistent and even make them really bold with proper spacing between other elements around them so that they stand out. So that as, as I'm scrolling, I can look at a piece of text and go, oh, that's a header. That's probably outlining what this next section is all about. Then for your body text or your paragraph, you wanna prioritize legibility. And how do you do that? Well don't go below about 16 pixels and keep it left aligned because any center text alignment or even justified alignment makes it really difficult for users to read. I love this example from Joanna Moss where she's got some really legible text and there's a nice solid contrast between the background and the text color itself. And then even bonus points, she's got some arrows that are pointing people's eyes towards the text that she's hoping they read. Also, make sure that you keep paragraph widths short. My rule of thumb is that you wanna to stick to about 70 characters as far as the maximum width of each little chunk of text is going to be. And then break a line every two to three sentences into a new paragraph. No one wants to read a wall of text. There have been studies after studies that have shown users feel intimidated and they just move past them. Next up, we've got our mobile design and you could see it in the title of this category. You always wanna design for mobile first. And why is that? Well, most users are engaging with your website on their phones. So you wanna start with the mobile design and then scale up from there rather than start with the desktop and then make a tiny little baby version on mobile. Because if your layout breaks on mobile or text begins to stack weird, it's not gonna work and users aren't going to engage. But also make sure that touch elements are big enough. What are touch elements? Well, they're anything on your mobile website that you're hoping people will put their fingers on, okay? So there's something that I use called Huber's Rule and he basically says that anything in the center of a mobile design can be about seven millimeters or 28 pixels in height and width in order for for it to be optimized for touch engagement. But as you get closer to the edge, you actually want to grow in size, right? So if you're towards the left or the right of the edge of the mobile device, you wanna to stick to about nine millimeters or 34 pixels in height and width. And then if you get to the corners, it, it has to be even bigger. <laughs> and so you want it to be about 12 millimeters or 45 pixels. And then for buttons, a good rule of thumb is to stick to about 48 pixels in height and width. This ensures that people aren't gonna have to fight to actually make sure that they clicked that thing. All right, now let's talk about forms because this is what we're hoping all people get to, filling out those forms. You wanna make sure that you're only asking for what is absolutely necessary in terms of information. In other words, you wanna minimize the required form field. So don't ask for an address when someone's just booking a call because every extra field equals less chance that a user is actually going to finish the form. And avoid drop downs. I've heard them be called the UI of last resort. <laughs> and why is that? Is It's because 
these slow users down, especially on mobile, and make it much less likely that they're gonna make it all the way through to that submit button. So instead, use things like toggles or checkboxes or even a list of options to keep things really simple. Next, make sure that you're grouping related fields. So if your form has multiple steps or different sections, put those different inputs together. So like name, email, and address should all be grouped together. Or in this example, like if they've got credit card information that you're wanting them to fill out, make sure that that is grouped in terms of layout and spacing. Doing that will help people to navigate and move through the form faster. Next, let's talk about images. You wanna make sure that you use images of real and happy people. <laughs> and so let's look at a couple of examples. These images here, they just look like candid shots where people were just hanging out and somebody happened to have a camera and they took it. So this is a good example of what a real image would look like. Like this woman looks like she's just having a great conversation and somebody made her laugh. And this looks like two friends are just having a conversation at a park. You can almost intrinsically tell, even if you're not a designer, whether or not a photo looks real or is kind of generic and stocky. So build your eye to be able to learn what makes certain photos look more real and what makes them more staged. Better yet, do some photo shoot and use your own images. Another thing you wanna make sure to do is use images that are looking towards the content that you're wanting people to see. This is a great example from Resync where they've got two photos where people are directly looking at where they're wanting the users to read at this header right here. We all intrinsically look towards where other people are looking. So if you've ever been in like a concert or a sports game, anytime a crowd starts looking in one direction, you're guaranteed that you're gonna look in that direction with everybody else. And the same is true in design. So don't have people that are looking away from the important stuff. Have them focusing on where you want the user to focus as well. Finally, accessibility. And really, you wanna always prioritize accessibility. Not just because you wanna make sure that your website is compliant, but it's actually better for everyone and it improves conversion. So make sure that your text has enough contrast between the background colors. One of the best tools that I like using is called Coolers. You can put all of your brand colors into a color palette and then it'll give you a contrast checker to know which colors are safe to put on top of each other. And then make sure that you're always adding things like alt text to every image. This helps with SEO, but it also helps with folks who might have some visual impairments. Whew. And that's it. These are the exact design principles that I use with clients to take a site from one that just looks good to one that really sells well. Now listen, you don't need to use all of these 22 tips at once. Maybe take one or two of these, bring them back to your site or put it into your workflow as a designer. But realize the more that you apply, the more results you're gonna start to see. If you'd like to download all of the slides that I used today in this video, there's gonna be a link to this in the description. And like I said earlier, this is part of a full series on helping your website sell even more. So if you haven't already, check out the video on writing the perfect hero section and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss what's next. I'll see you in the next video.